The song Wilderness here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. We are on the road in Missoula, Montana. We're broadcasting from the University of Montana. Uh, we're talking to Gayla Benefeld. Uh, Thirty members of her extended family have been as affected by the asbestos in Libby, Montana. Her husband and she both suffer from asbestos exposure as a result of the W.R. Grace plant that was operating for decades in her her town of Libby. I want to turn now to a documentary called Libby, Montana. It had its natural broadcast, its national broadcast premiere on PBS's POV in 2007. Their website is pbs.org slash POV. It tells the story of the residents of Libby. This is a clip of former W.R. Grace employee Les Scranstead. He worked in the mill only two years, but died of mesothelioma in 2007. He talks about what it was like to work in the mine. My first experience there was, what in the hell did I get myself into? I just couldn't believe that the dust and the, uh, the dirt. into the construction room because that's where I was told to report and he told me I was going to be a sweeper in a dry mill and I had no idea what he was talking about. But first you go over to the uh, <clears throat> warehouse and get a respirator. I had this respirator on and in about 15 minutes I couldn't breathe. So I pulled this respirator off and it was just plugged solid. I thought, boy, I'm not getting nothing done and if I don't, I'm going to get canned. So I just pulled the respirator off and let it dangle around my neck here. And I, and I really went to work. And uh, at noon, I went back down to eat lunch. And I, I was just covered with this dust everywhere. And uh, Tom DeShazer was sitting in there. And he was the foreman of the, of the uh, construction department. And he said, how do you like that? Dust, and I said, "Jesus, that's the worst I ever seen. I, I can't, I can't imagine anything like it. Like it's the worst I ever seen." And geez, they all laughed, you know, and slapped her leg and said, "Ah, it's just a nuisance. Dust. You'll get used to it." The stuff was in your clothes. It was everywhere. It was so fine, the only way you knew it is you'd put a cup of coffee and you look down and you could see it settling in the top of your coffee. But you couldn't see it in the air, but you could see it settling in your coffee. You couldn't get it off of me, really. It just stuck. Uh, same way with the ore, you know, and so I took it home with me. And, uh, and I'd walk in the house, you know, the, my oldest daughter and my oldest son, they'd grab me by the legs, you know, because they was happy to see me and hear them coming to Rita, you know, and she'd come over, you know, and we'd have a hug and, Christ, I was covered with this stuff, you know. It, it wasn't that I was being sloppy, it was just that I couldn't get it off. That was W.R. Grace employee Les Scranstead. He worked in the mill only two years, but died of mesothelioma in 2007, talking about what it was like to work there. Uh, Gayla Benefield, he was a friend of yours. Can you talk more about him? Yes, Les was a very close family friend. Uh, actually, he was a, he and his wife were friends of my, my parents as I grew up. Uh, my father and he both played music together. And, uh, when I, this is another one that I more or less discovered. He was sick, he was coughing, and I convinced him to to uh, go to Dr. Whitehouse and to be tested. And he found out in probably about 1995 that he had the disease himself and was given roughly 10 years to live. And that was disturbing enough, but he was more than willing to live with that because he had worked and, and felt he had taken a responsibility to support his family. But I was with him the day that he received the letter that told him that his wife and two of his children were diagnosed. 
And uh, that was the most heart-wrenching time because uh, the man simply crumbled. And to find out that he had actually exposed his, his children, who were small babies at the time, to this terrible dust. And by the time I filed the complaint with the DEQ, uh, Les and I both took our anger, and instead of, of lashing out, we decided to do something constructive with it. <clears throat> and uh, so he was really the, you might say, the support behind me all the way when probably nobody else in town even wanted to talk to me uh, in fighting W.R. Grace. And, and he was really, he was really a, a wonderful person. He was a rock, and he simply believed in, in, uh, in, in right. And, and he felt that we had been, the whole community had been terribly wronged by this, this company when no one else would believe it. And uh, tragically... Gayla, this is another excerpt from okay. the documentary, Libby Montana. Uh, okay. This is a clip of the former W.R. Grace plant manager, Earl Lovick. His commentary is from a videotaped deposition recorded during a civil case against W.R. Grace in the 90s. Here he's talking about his knowledge of the hazards of the dust produced at the Libby Mill. What is your understanding of what asbestosis is? My understanding is it's the, it's the disease of the lungs. And uh, to your knowledge, have ex-workers at uh, Zonalite died of asbestosis? Well, to my knowledge, ex-workers of Zonalite uh, who have died, one of the causes of death is uh, asbestosis. Uh, I don't recall whether any of them, have, their death certificate stated that that was a primary cause, but uh, it would have been one of the contributing factors. Uh, were some of these people friends of yours? Yes, sir. And does the number of them with asbestosis um, as a uh, cause of death concern you? I would object on the basis that it's irrelevant and immaterial to the issues of this lawsuit and prejudicial. Go ahead and answer it to the extent you can. Well, of course, I'm concerned about when any of my friends die for many, for many reasons. So. In that respect, uh, the answer would be yes. Okay, let's go to Exhibit 17. This appeared to be a letter from Mr. Wake to Mr. Blake, dated uh, September 21, 1956. Yes, sir. Do you see a uh, Montana State Board of Health report of an industrial hygiene study, August 8 to 9, 1956? Yes, sir. You see three lines down under toxicity. Uh, the, the asbestos dust in the dust in the air is of considerable toxicity and is a factor in the consideration of reducing dustiness in this plant. Yes, sir. That? Was this report your first knowledge of what asbestosis was? To the best of my recollection, this report is the first uh, that we or I knew of the uh, dangers of asbestos in the workplace. So as of 1956, uh, the company knew there was asbestos in the dust, correct? Yes, sir. And the company also knew that uh, asbestosis is from inhaling asbestos dust, correct? Yes, sir. And the company also knew there were workers uh, at Zone Light who were inhaling asbestos dust, correct? Yes, sir. In 1956, did you, did uh, the company disclose to the employees that the asbestos in the dust in the air was toxic? Not that I recall, no, sir. That was a clip of former W.R. Grace plant manager Earl Lovick. Um, I, Gayla Benefeld, talk more about Earl Lovick. Well, Earl was a, <clears throat> actually not the, he was only the plant manager for a brief amount of time. He was pretty much second in command. But uh, the majority of the correspondence between uh, the main office and the company up here came through his office, and his name is on the majority of the documents. And it, it really is tragic because everything that I had felt about the mine, I found out once I saw the court documents and saw all of the correspondence. And at any time, uh, the men were never, never told 
that this dust was dangerous. They were told it was like farm dust. You, you could eat a ton of it, it wouldn't hurt you. And this went on, the lie went on until the mine shut down. Finally, in the early 80s, they told the men it was tremolite, but it was the harmless form of tremolite, so not to worry about it. Uh, the other thing that actually hasn't come out in the court case, and, and it isn't going to be released for some reason, is the fact that there was never an inspection, a state inspection, but what the men had three days notice. And I've talked to men who worked over the full 40 years who uh, uh, yes, would attest to that, that uh, any time there was an inspection, they were told the inspectors were coming. They were given a two to three days.